Hey there everybody and welcome back to another Blender tutorial. If I'm talking weird, it's because I'm out in public today and there's nothing that makes me want to die more than talking into a camera uh, in public where people are looking at you like, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? What is wrong with me is that uh, today I really want to make a, a crater tutorial. So I'm out here recording some footage of this uh, parking lot and uh, we are going to put a crater in it. If you've recently seen the uh, CG Matter video I uploaded within the last day or two, uh, you've seen how this effect uh, can be used in different spots and it's fully procedural, etc. But uh, it's a tutorial I covered a long, long time ago, but I wanted to redo it with the modern, uh, I feel like I'm better at Blender now uh, treatment. So I'm gonna go record this footage and I'll see you uh, indoors where we're gonna edit it. Okay, so I feel like I already did the introduction, so let's just hop right into the tutorial. So again, the result we're gonna be making is exactly this. We're making a three-dimensional crater that is fully procedural um, inside our scene. And it doesn't look like this one we render. It actually has more detail and I did a bit of color correction uh, so that it looks something more like this on a frame by frame basis. And this is something, uh, again, I've done a tutorial about this before, but like I said in the recording, I wanna do it better. So. Uh, we're gonna start fresh. Let's just start off with a new scene. And the only thing you need to follow this tutorial other than Blender is some footage, okay? So here's the footage we are gonna be uh, messing with. We're gonna track it. We're gonna add a crater. We're gonna love it. We're gonna bring it to bed. There's a lot of things to do with this footage. So let's see it. Let me just mute it uh, for my own behalf. I don't think you can hear it. Uh, but it's just some uh, phone footage, actually, of me recording in the uh, parking lot. And let that be a lesson to you. For you guys who think you need a fancy cam or camera with a DSLR and all that, um, really, you just have a limiting belief. Uh, you can film on a phone. You could even film on a potato and make it work. Uh, the only thing I did when recording this is I made sure I was moving slow, and I made sure that my shutter speed was something so that there wasn't that much motion blur. Um, and this is all so that we can track it. Speaking of which, let's track our footage. This is something I haven't done in a hot minute. I used to be the tracking king, um, but I uh, left her for a mistress called the uh, Geometry Nodes. Movie Clip Editor. Open a movie clip. This is how we do tracking. If you've never seen tracking before, I'm going to keep it super simple. All you have to do is first of all import your footage, which involves finding it. There it is. And uh, boop, uh, we have our footage inside a blender. Uh, to make sure that it's playing quickly and not at this kind of laggy rate, first of all, we're gonna set scene frames, which is gonna make sure our project out point is the same as the length of our footage. So in this case, my footage is 291 frames. So it sets it to 291 frames. And then I'm gonna hit prefetch, which loads the rest of the video into memory. Final thing, uh, go to the, uh, what, what's this? Render tab, render properties. I've been calling it render tab for three years. Nobody told me. Go to color management, go to view transform, set it to standard. And you can see there was a tiny bit of a difference there. It doesn't affect tracking, but it does affect how pleasing it is to my eye. Uh, this just makes it so that the footage looks standard. We're not applying a filmic uh, view transform over it. Okay, we have footage, we can play it, let's track it. Now, uh, the way we do this traditionally is you add a tracker, never mind how I do this, but you track it throughout the scene and you can see, you know, it does a thing. I'm gonna do this very simply. Um, on the left here, we have our tracker settings, as you may or may not know. Uh, the only thing I'm gonna change is I'm gonna hit this normalize button. This is gonna make it so that every tracker I add is gonna have this feature, which makes it so that if there's a bit of lighting change, which there shouldn't be, but if there is, it's gonna keep on tracking. It's gonna normalize those lighting intensities. And maybe one other thing is I'm gonna take the search area and bring this up. In other words, um, every tracker we're gonna add is gonna have these settings so that uh, it's ideal for our scene. I increase the search area just so it has a bit more chance to track from frame to frame to frame. Either way, I'm gonna detect features. And you can see it did perfectly fine here. It's gonna look for high contrast areas and each of these trackers inherits these settings. And you can uh, mess with this to increase the amount of trackers. Like you can bring down the threshold. You can see that added a couple trackers, especially if you bring it lower and you also decrease the distance so that you can have two trackers within 90 pixels of each other. Either way, uh, once you have all of these, go to track, hit track forwards or hit control T uh, like a man who knows shortcuts. Control T, it's gonna track all of these together. Notice that only four trackers, five, uh, made it to the end of the shot. Uh, this is because the camera's moving around a lot, but you can see there's a lot in the beginning. Either way, I'm gonna take all of these and lock them. I like them, so we're gonna lock them with control L and we have some trackers. Of course, uh, we want more trackers than we have because you can see they're slowly disappearing. And uh, if you've never done tracking before, 
The name of the game is to have eight solid trackers throughout the shot, um, ideally all over the place, which we do not have. So I'm going to go to the last frame. We're going to detect features. So now I'm adding even more trackers on top, the, on top of the locked ones. And this time we track backwards because we're at the last frame. We go backwards. Shortcut is shift control T. And I know this is a crater tutorial, not a tracking tutorial. So I'm just going to get through this quickly. Uh, finally, I'm going to go halfway down the footage to make sure we have new trackers spawned here that are going to track both forwards and backwards. So again, detect features on frame 120 or 121, I guess. Control T to track forwards. So hopefully we get some more at the end. And then go back to frame 121 so you can see those trackers disappear there. And on 121, shift control T. So those are from the middle, tracked forwards and backwards. We're going to lock them. Um, at the end of the day, what we get is a lot of trackers that hopefully make it so that at any time there's eight solid ones. I imagine that is the case. And if there's not, you can always add in more. But I think this is fine. Uh, before we take these and get camera motion out of it, in other words, get a camera self, we want to make sure we get rid of the trackers that are problematic. Spank them out of existence. How do we do that? Uh, go to the movie clip editor, and instead of clip, go to the graph. This is going to give us the red X and the green Y data of each tracker. It's X and Y location on the screen. And you're going to notice that most of these are almost the same, you know, with tiny variations, because all these trackers are vaguely moving together. The camera is moving in one motion, so every spot on the screen vaguely is moving in the same direction, except for some of these outliers. This outlier, I'm just going to, so you can select different ones, I'm going to select it and then spank it. X to delete. So in other words, I'm looking for trackers that are very irregular and very obviously problematic, and I'm just pruning them out for those of you who've seen Loki. So I'm just clicking these. There's an automated way to do this. I'm not going to do it that way. Um, it should be very visually obvious which ones of these to get rid of. Some of them are kind of passable, uh, but ideally the more problematic trackers you get rid of, uh, the tighter your solve is going to be. And you want a tight solve because tightness is good. It's um, constrictive, and I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. Uh, either way, we got rid of the problematic trackers, most of them, and you can see now all the remaining trackers exist in this, uh, whoops, in this nice little bundle. So that uh, you can see we have trackers, but some of them have been gotten rid of. At this point, I think we are ready to solve. So go to the solve panel. Yay, we're almost done with this part. You're welcome. Uh, we only need to click a couple things here. First of all, is this a tripod shot? No, so I'm not gonna click it, right? The camera's moving, it's not on a tripod with a nodal pan, right? So disable that. For keyframe, you can try enabling this, but it's gonna take a long time to solve. So here's what I recommend. Instead of clicking this, we're just gonna pick our keyframe A and B. What these are, long story short, is it's two numbers, two frames that we pick uh, that have some trackers in common, but in terms of parallax and where they are relative to each other, it's a bit different. In other words, I'm gonna look at the footage, I'm going to pick two frames that I like. For example, this frame, for whatever reason, frame 105 is fine. I'm going to start here. I'm going to move down. And you can see a lot of these trackers still exist, but I've moved into the parking lot a bit more. So we've introduced some difference in parallax. If I look between here and here, you can see the camera has some motion. So hopefully that should be fine. And our goal, uh, when we solve for the camera, we're going to get a pixel error. We want to get this under one pixel. And we're not going to get that immediately. But either way, solve camera motion. What do we get? 4.46. Not that bad. Uh, I mean, not ideal. We want it under a pixel, but it could have been much worse. Some of you might have gotten 20 pixels, 80 pixels, whatever. Now we need to do the work of bringing this under one. And the main thing that is going to help us is we need to add more and more information so that this error, this pixel error, can get lower and lower and lower. And the main piece of information we have not added is the focal length. How zoomed in am I? In this case, I'm very, very zoomed out. This is a super widescreen shot because it was filmed with a phone, which has that widescreen camera. At least this iPhone does. God damn it. Um, so we want to address that. Uh, one way is you could try hitting focal length and solving again might or might not help we'll find out it helped a little um if it's not helping we need to pick the uh, focal length manually so go to track go to camera because we're looking at our camera properties we want to say the lens how zoomed in was it um so i happen to know that the iphone uses like a focal length of like something between 12 and 15 uh, so i'm going to pick a number somewhat close to that so let's try that solve camera motion now we're getting way closer to the number one Let's try increasing it. 
that's livable. Uh, to get this even a bit lower, so what this indicates is that each uh, prediction I made is closer and closer to the real focal length in most likelihood. Uh, we can try doing another refinement now that we're close to it. I don't know if this is going to help or hurt. Might help, might hurt. There we go. So it went from 13 to 13.69. So just a bit of a budge, but now we're definitely under a pixel. We're under half a pixel, so that's pretty good. And you can keep doing this, right? You can find the optical center, the radial distortion, a bunch of shit nobody cares about, but I'm happy with this. So once we have our solve under a pixel, let's actually move on to making the crater, uh, which is the interesting part of the video. And if you don't know how to track, I guess this part was also interesting. How do we get this camera motion in here? Because right now I go to the camera, I click play, there's nothing except for the fact that our camera, you're gonna notice, has turned into a widescreen 13.69 uh, camera. So other than that, nothing's been imported. Well, to get this camera solved with this uh, solve error, by the way, we should save. I'm gonna call this in shameless self-promotion available on Patreon because this uh, project file, once we're done, or maybe the original, is gonna be available on Patreon. So just sit back, relax, just watch, just learn. Um, there, there's something stressful about watching a video and then clicking all the buttons and trying to make sure that I don't go ahead of you. Just watch. Um, once we have our camera solved, how do we get it in here? Well, we've solved our camera motion, so all we have to do is hit Setup Tracking Scene, which does a lot of stuff, but one of the things it does is you can see it added a plane, some collection, some foreground, background. But one thing it did is you can see our camera is now moving. The motion's been included. Let's see what that looks like. So you can see it's it's off but it is tracking. It almost looks like this plane is slightly hovering above it so that it doesn't look attached to the ground. Uh, but you can see generally we have the right idea. Uh, so finally, last thing we need to do for this camera solve is we need to make sure that it is set up so that, and I can actually show this uh, information by enabling motion tracking dots, which I can make way tinier. So each of these empties is representing one of these trackers. Uh, we wanna make it so that these are on the ground because that's where they were tracked. So you can see it's off. Uh, to do that, simple thing, just select three trackers that are on the ground, any three, doesn't matter, and just hit floor. And you can see what that did is it moved all our motion tracking dots so that they're on the floor. And now when we play this, it actually looks like this thing's connected to the ground. So again, we had a good solve, but our orientation or where our floor is, where we said our camera is spatially, was incorrect. And maybe we can make a couple other adjustments, like this thing is huge, so I'm just going to select two trackers that are on the ground again, and I'm going to hit set scale, and what that's going to do is it's going to make it so that their three-dimensional distance is one unit apart, or I can make it two unit, of, you, you, yeah. unit, 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 a unit has a unit, and he's about it. Either way, uh, I can make it two units apart, set scale, and now it's going to be effectively smaller. Uh, each of, each time I do this, it's going to make it so that the camera, if I make it three, uh, looks like it's a bit further away, but I'm going to do two. So you can see that looks pretty good. This plane and this, um, cube are perfectly tracked on. And basically the name of the game at this point is replacing this plane with a, and a cube with a crater because we can put any object and it's going to look like it's in our scene. So let's just get rid of all of this. We're done tracking. Congratulations. We've graduated, so I'm just going to disable this. And at this point, if you just want to kind of do a bit more correction, you can just select your camera, the literal camera object, and just move it on the X, Y, Z axis, rotate, whatever. So I'm just going to position it here. So what do we have so far? We have our footage uh, seen through our camera lens. The camera is hopefully the right focal length, and everything's tracked on properly. And we have a plane. Again, anything we add on to here, like a torus is uh, going to look like it's in our scene. So now all we have to do is make the uh, crater, uh, which is in some sense simpler, conceptually harder maybe, but in terms of steps simpler than tracking. Either way, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start off with a plane like we have here and you just make it big enough so that the crater can be contained inside of it. So if you want it to be a small crater, like a little pothole, you can have a small plane. If you want it big, make a big plane, but you don't want to have a big plane for a small crater because then we'd be wasting some geometry, some real estate. So don't make it too huge. Something like that and position it. To make this a crater, uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to use an old technique. I know it's all geometry nodes now. The kids are running around, driving in their cars with their, with their girlfriends, throwing around their geometry nodes. 
but I'm going to go and take it back a couple decades, back when we used to use shader nodes. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this uh, crater using vector displacement, something we haven't used in a while. In other words, it's all going to be in material. To do this, first of all, we need more geometry because this plane is just four points. One, two, three, four, right? Uh, if we're using vector displacement, we still need geometry to move. So add a subdivision surface, set it to simple so it doesn't do this uh, kind of curvature thing to it. Set it to simple, and then instead of increasing the number of divisions each time, which is going to add more and more vertices, I'm going to do this in the fancy way. We're going to use cycles. Make sure you're in cycles or you're not going to see this. And in feature set, go to experimental. Again, cycles, so that you can set it to experimental. And you're going to see we're going to have this option um, added called adaptive subdivision. It's only in cycles. And what this does is instead of saying subdivide three, four, or five times, it's going to do it off the fly depending on how far away we're from the camera and what dicing scale. In other words, just hit this button. Okay? This makes it so that we have a lot of geometry to work with. Let's actually work with that geometry now. So we're going to go to the shading workspace. I'm going to add a material. We're going to call this crater. And again, everything we're going to do to make this thing a crater is going to be in the material. Might be weird if you haven't used displacement before. But materials can actually move geometry if you use displacement. Let me show you how. So first of all, we need to make our crater map. So I'm going to start with texture coordinates. And if you think about, let's see this in rendered view. We are not seeing any of this. Why am I not seeing this? Let's think about it for a moment. And I'm not saying that as a quiz. I literally don't know why can we not see our material. Okay, I figured out what's wrong. Uh, this is the thing that happens when you hit setup tracking scene from before. Our object is in the background collection. I don't know why we have a background collection. Collection. So just delete that, delete the foreground collection, and also in this background layer we can delete that. Uh, so that we have one render layer and can call it main and everything exists there. Um, so... If we now select our ground object and go back to our original material. Yeah, there we go. Just a bit of a thing I forgot about. So either way, everything is in this collection. We can see it. Uh, we're going to add texture coordinates. And specifically, I want object coordinates. Why? Uh, because our goal is to make a crater, which is basically a circle that we distort. That's what a crater is. To make a circle, object coordinates are very useful uh, because we know where the center is. You can see this cross shows where the center is, the 0, 0, 0 vector. What I'm going to do is I'm going to process this through some vector math. I want to say how far away is each point from the 3D cursor from the middle. And we can use that using a length function, which is going to give us the distance, the length, the magnitude of each vector. So towards the middle, we get a something very, very close to 0 or black. And as we go radially outwards, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It's a radial gradient. Or I think technically it's a spherical gradient. Radial gradient has to do with angles. Either way, we're going to take this and we want to turn it into a nice circle. Um, so one way you could do this, by the way, is you could just set, set, send, god damn, send this through some math and do a greater than, less than. So we're saying what lengths are bigger or smaller than some number. That's fine. Uh, but I want to have a bit of our fall off. So fancy way to do this. Map range. We're going to take these numbers and invert them. So we're taking our distances from 0 to 1 and flipping them from 1 to 0. Uh, but we have a bit more control because now we can say how big is our crater. In other words, what distances are we looking at as inputs that are being sent to 0 to 1? And we can control kind of the contrast of this gradient, so kind of the fall off. Uh, this map range kind of does it all. And if we now, well, we could distort it and then do displacement or displacement and then distort it. Let's distort it first. So now we have a circle that we can control the contrast of, right? and the size, and I want it to look like a crater. So final thing we're going to do is basically add randomness. Noise texture is going to be our source of randomness. Uh, make sure that the coordinate system that this noise texture is using is the same as the one we're using from before. In other words, object coordinates on both. Don't have one use generated, one use object. It makes it messy. So with this noise texture, it's basically a source of randomness, as I said. What I'm going to do is I'm going to mix this with our source of randomness so that they're now being kind of added together. So you can see before, after, we're just adding that randomness. Um, final thing you want to do, hit linear light. What this is going to do is it's going to apply this noise in a way where everything doesn't kind of scale away to the side. So let's see what this looks like. Yeah, that looks pretty good. So we're just kind of breaking this up and we can control the look of this by changing the noise parameters. So as you can see, this will change our kind of 
thing. And we'll uh, go back and change what this looks like once we actually see the crater. So now I want you to think of this as basically a height map saying, um, or maybe a depth map, kind of the opposite of height, uh, saying how far down should the crater be? Well, in the middle, it's very white, so it should be going very down. And then gradually, this will have a fall off to go off to the surface, and then the actual surface is black. Meaning, meaning if we now send this through a displacement node, so the thing that actually pushes the geometry, connect this to height, connect this to displacement, it's almost working. As you can see, it's trying. You can almost see the shading here as we move the light. It's trying to displace it, but it can't yet because uh, there's a step that's hidden in the material. Go to settings. Again, we're in cycles. This is a material displacement thing in cycles. In the uh, settings, we got to make sure our displacement isn't set to bump only so that it's like this visual thing, but actually displacement only. So it moves our geometry. And you can see actual transformation. Set the mid-level to zero so it doesn't shift it. But now you can see the scale um, is doing this thing. Now, of course... Uh, this is the opposite uh, from what we want. It's kind of making a mountain. And to uh, visualize this, let's just get rid of the background. So film, transparent. Now we can see this uh, in context. It's the opposite of what we want. So instead of setting the scale to a big number, set it to a big number in the negative dimension. So instead of three, set it to negative three or something. So you can see as we go negative, it, the geometry is being pushed the other way. And this is kind of like the basics of making a crater. So now, uh, really, the name of the game is making it look good. But first of all, I'm going to make sure our background is bright enough so we can see. And let's also get rid of the uh, stuff that is out of frame. I don't want to see that either. So there's viewport display, passer part out. I know I pronounce it wrong. I don't care. Um, so how do we make our crater look good? Well, it's looking bad because, one, we don't have enough geometry. That's why you see this kind of harsh clipping in all this. We don't have enough geometry. And second of all, our crater map is garbage, right? So let's fix both those things. To add geometry, take this number, bring it lower. You can see immediately we get more detail. And second of all, in our crater map, we can increase the detail that is being used for displacement. So take this from 2 to 8. Uh, you're going to notice above 8, nothing really changes. So you just want to keep adding more geometry. And that's going to add more uh, resolution in that sense. Don't push this above 8. Uh, but we need to pick numbers that look good. So I'm just going to play around with this. By the way, you could set this to a four-dimensional noise and get different crater types, just like that. Uh, but I'm not going to. Uh, you can play with the roughness. If you bring this too high, you run the risk of it looking like an egg crate. <laughs> so be smart about it. Um, okay, I think that's a good start. Uh, we want to add a second layer of detail because, okay, we have geometry displacement, but it still kind of looks smooth and boring. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add even more detail using a normal map. So a bump node is going to convert this noise texture into normal information. So you can see, normal information connected. It adds the second layer of grunge. Now, uh, what you're seeing is, yes, it looks better. Uh, but of course, we want the crater to only exist in the crater and not affect uh, the floor, right? The parking lot. And in fact, uh, this doesn't look much like a crater at all. It looks like a piece of rock we slapped on top. Uh, so what I want to do in this step, and I'll drink water to mark the transition point, is we want to somehow set up this material so that this floor is transparent, right? It's not showing anything, uh, but it's a bit more complicated than that because if I mix our G or mix shader, so instead of just using a principled BSDF, I'm going to mix this with another shader. I'm going to say I want part of it to be transparent. So use a transparent B BSDF. You can see when it's transparent, we get the floor. When it's the other one, we get the other one. We got to make a mask. Um, so a simple way to do this is we want to say when it's at the floor level, have it be the, the footage and otherwise have it be the crater. In other words, we just care about the height of this. Uh, so simple way to do this, separate X, Y, Z, again, using object coordinates. And I just want to know, hey, uh, where is the Z coordinate uh, greater than, less than, like zero? So let's visualize this. So you can see this is kind of a mask that shows us depth as we bring it down because it's showing us uh, what uh, val which, uh, parts of the mesh have a Z value bigger than or less than some number, right? So I'm going to set it to zero, take it, set it to the mix shader, view it, and you can see that kind of works. By the way, you don't want to set this to zero. You want to set it to like minus 0.01. That's going to fix these artifacts. And you can see um, that essentially does it. 
like we've kind of fixed the issue uh but one the transition super rough like first there's crater and then there's not crater and second of all i don't think this is going to be a problem for this shot uh, but if we were to take the scale and make it like much lower like minus eight uh, you can see the other side of the crater poking out so again we have crater but we can also see kind of the outer side of that cup because uh, the plane is transparent but you can see through it right um, long story short, take this transparent BSDF and switch it with a holdout. And you can see there's a bit of a subtle difference here. Um, if you don't understand, I will just set it back and forth so you can see the difference. Transparent, we'll get rid of it, but we can still see through it. Holdout does that, but it also makes every pixel in that area like alpha zero is what I'm trying to say. So holdout is going to fix that issue I was talking about where you can see the underside of the... Uh, the outer side of the crater and if you can see a bit more of it poking out just make the plane bigger as you can see so this will make it look like this thing coming out of nowhere kind of like a void uh, is what holdout is useful for uh, either way i probably don't want it to be that deep so let's bring that up and uh that's looking better uh we still have the harsh transition so now we're in make it look way better mode and that's going to be in terms of the crater in terms of the lighting whatever uh, but let's just fix a bunch of things. So first of all, this transition's garbage. I want, instead of it being either holdout or principled BSDF, have it be a bit of a softer transition. In other words, this greater than is not cutting it. So just like last time to create the crater, uh, we're going to use a map range. I'm going to say, uh, what do we want to set 0 to 1? Well, we want to say, where are, we, where are we ground level? And then when are we slightly dipping into the crater, right? We wanted to know where it's greater than negative 0.01. So same idea. Uh, go from 0 to negative 0.02 or something like that. And clearly, it's doing the opposite. So we need to invert it. And you can see now there's a bit of a softer transition if you can't see it. I'm just going to decrease this number a bit more. And now you can see there's this nice fall off, which uh, hides it a bit better. But you want to pick a number that looks good, just so it's nice and uh, gradual. I'm going to set it to smoother step. And I'm going to make it a bit larger in magnitude. So um, remember before we had this harsh thing, now we have a bit of a softer transition, which I think helps the look of it. Okay, um, again, just remember at any point you can add more or a smaller dicing number and get more detail. Uh, but for now, I'm happy with this. Uh, color of it, I want it to be rougher and I want it to be kind of a darkish color, something like that. Uh, but the main issue at this point Crater actually looks good as a three-dimensional object. Uh, main issue is our lighting is garbage. We just have like a light that is randomly placed, right? It doesn't make much sense. Uh, we got to fix that. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a light as a sun. Nice thing about a sun is that it kind of has infinite distance. And we want to pick a direction for this so that the shadow is going the right way. Uh, we know which way the right way is because you can see these cars have shadows. So shadows should be pointing this way towards the camera. So let, let me think about this. I'm rotating the sun on the x-axis. I think this is correct because it would catch uh, this part of the floor and cast a shadow this way. So either way, I'm just taking my sun object and I'm rotating it uh, so that the shadow is in the correct direction. And I guess it should be pretty steep. And uh, in terms of the intensity of it, just go to the light options. You can increase the strength of your sun, whatever, which is also going to up the contrast of this shadow border, it seems. Um, and we can fix a lot of this in a color correction afterwards. But just make this like somewhat strong. Uh, the angle is the softness of the shadow. So you can see here we have a harsh boundary. You set it to 25, and it softens it a lot more. Um, just like last uh, time with matching the shadow, you want to match the softness of it. So it's pretty harsh, but not perfectly harsh. So something like two degrees. Don't worry about it. So we can always go back and correct this. So this is the first part of making our lighting setup. Uh, the second part is let's add an HDRI just for the environment lighting. Because right now it's, you can't see it, uh, but there's just kind of a gray cast everywhere. And we want to add a bit of, you know, ambient lighting. Um, so environment texture. So I'm just going to the HDRI. I'm going to the world settings and I'm adding an HDRI. So environment texture, what kind? Um, an HDRI. I don't. I download mine from HDRI Haven. So I'm just going to pick a, 
I mean, we can play with these. Each one of these is gonna give a different kind of look, so you wanna be careful. So this makes it look super bright. We can actually swap it in the uh, world materials. That one makes it look super bright. You can pick one that's overcast. Um, in general, uh, the key idea is you want to pick an HDRI that matches the environment you shot in. So you don't want an indoor one if you shot outdoors and vice versa. So I'm just going to pick one that looks okay. That looks fine. And uh, you can see everything's way too bright. So I'm going to bring down our sun intensity. And for our HDRI, you can do this from here or from the strength. These are the same number. Uh, you can bring down the ambient light. And again, we're going to do a bit more color correction. Okay. Or we're going to do color correction. Uh, for the crater, uh, now let's pick a color that makes a bit more sense. So it is kind of this dark gray. I mean, it depends. Do you want it to be like rock and dirt down here? You can pick. But pick a color that looks okay. And um, what we can do is add a bit of variation here. So just like uh, every single time where we used a map range, let's use one more. And I'm going to use this map range to pick uh, two colors for our crater. So the idea is, I'm just going to use the color for both of these. I want to have two colors. So for the sake of example, I'm going to have the color red. We can use the same map range idea uh, to create a gradient, although I don't see it quite yet. Oh, it's because we want the uh, Z component, just like last time. So what am I doing here if it's not clear? I am creating a, a gradient where we have two colors using the uh, Z uh, fall off in some sense. Um, so now that we can pick the colors, let's make the surface color, I don't know, I guess it should get darker as it goes down. So let's have this one be a tiny bit darker, almost like adding an artificial shadow, but we can make it a bit grungier, a bit more dirt colored. It's subtle, but it should add a bit of something. And then for the other one, a bit darker. Okay, that looks okay. Again, there's always compositing, so do not worry. Um, okay, so that looks pretty good. Um, what else do I wanna add to this? Uh, well, you're noticing that this whole area is like concrete. I don't know what materials are, asphalt. Um, it has this kind of fine noise to it. So I'm thinking let's add something like that to our thing, even though it's a different material underneath, whatever. Uh, I'm going to do this by mixing this with a color. So you can see I can mix it with whatever color. And uh, for that color, I'm going to use a very, very fine, fine looking <laughs> uh, noise texture. Like bring up the scale quite a bit. And I guess let's also use object coordinates. So you can see it basically makes a very, very uh, sharp noise. And we can make that even sharper by filtering this through like a greater than um, like that. So let's see what this looks like. So I'm going to mix these together. Um, I want them to multiply so some areas get darker. And let's see. So this is, oh, let's view it through the BSDF. This is without. This is with a lot of it. As you can see, it's kind of like a zebra thing. Uh, you want to pick somewhere in between just to add a bit of texture. So again, here's before. Here's after. It just adds a bit more detail. Other than that, I think I'm pretty happy with this. So let's just kind of pick final crater shapes. Again, don't forget, uh, this noise is what affects the uh, crater kind of shape and all that. So you want to pick a smooth one or whatever. Pick the amount of distortion. This is kind of a big setting. Uh, just pick settings that look good. Something like that. And once we're happy with this, uh, let's try a render out. So I'm going to take down our samples. How long have we been going for? Hot minute, but this is definitely a tutorial that teaches you how to make a crater. There's no doubt about that. Uh, so let's try render. It's gonna take a second because of our adaptive subdivision. Um, but yeah, you can see this is super high detail. Um, you're gonna notice, that looks pretty good actually. Uh, we're gonna need to uh, do some more stuff in compositing. So you can see there's all these nodes. I never added them, why are they there? Again, that setup tracking scene, the thing that added these collections, the uh, render layers, whatever, it also does this. So you can get rid of most of these nodes, honestly. Uh, the reason they're there is normally you have two render layers, one for shadow catchers in a background and one for everything else in the foreground. And you might have also calculated for radial distortion. That's why there was a distort node. Uh, we're not messing with that. 
All we need is this movie clip node that shows the footage and our render layers node that shows the uh, render layer, the, the crater, and we put one on top of the other. And the main compositing that I would recommend doing here is adding, I would just do this from like here, like messing with the exposure, but you can see it messes with the whole image. So I'd recommend adding your exposure in gamma. By the way, Alt V and V to zoom in and out. I'd recommend just changing these until the, like it feels like it matches a bit more. Uh, you could do this systematically, like look at the how dark the shadows are and whatever. I'm not, I'm just gonna eyeball it. So gamma is gonna make it kind of more high contrast. And exposure, it's gonna add a bit of exposure. So let's see, here is before and after. Kind of subtle, <laughs> but I think it adds a bit of something. And then finally, if I zoom in here, you're gonna notice that the asphalt's very sharp, whereas our render isn't. And again, this was filmed with, a, with an iPhone, so it has that camera, phone camera sharpness thing going on. So I'm just gonna add a filter, and instead of soften, we want the opposite, set it to sharpen, and we want just a bit of sharpening. So here is before and after. And really the uh, key to making this look real is uh, playing around with these settings a lot until it like looks correct. Like the color is a bit off. Uh, maybe I could have made my crater look better, uh, but that's the essence of it, right? You basically now take this and render it for every single frame. You can see it works with the camera motion. You can add a bit of motion blur, whatever. So I think uh, that's the essence of it. I got you 95% of the way there. The last 5% is the artistry. You can also, by the way, if you wanna add little 3D objects, you can add little pebbles and stuff on the rim, right? It's a 3D space, it's up to you. So I think uh, with this 35 minute tutorial, I'm happy with that. So let's uh, finish out. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this tutorial. As always, this has been brought to you by the very generous patrons. There's over 760 now. I've been saying 750 for so long, but now there are 760, almost 770 of you. Um, and all of you are credited here in the credits. Why should you, a viewer who's made it to the end of the tutorial, uh, join Patreon? Well, three main benefits. One, early access. You could have seen this tutorial earlier than other people. Sometimes that's a day early. Sometimes that's a week early, depending on my schedule. Second of all, blend files. You could have gotten this blend file, the finished product, uh, with your Patreon membership. And um, any blend file I've ever uploaded, you can download them all at once because I've been on it for three years. There's a lot, hundreds of blend files and project files to download early access, blend files, and third of all, exclusive tutorials. Lately, it's been one a month, but it has been sometimes a tutorial series a month. Uh, very in-depth tutorials like this one uh, going over different projects. So extra tutorials, blend files, um, early access, and sometimes random posts. Check it out. It is the best way and the most direct way to support this channel and CG Matter. I thank you for it. Get your name in the credits, and thank you all uh, for making it to the end of a 30-something minute tutorial. Not easy with the attention span that I and everybody else has these days. I hope you learned something, and that's it. I'll see you.